messages released overnight. Politico calls them smoking texts where U.S. diplomats appear to link a meeting between President Trump and Ukraine's leader with an investigation into the 2016 election and an investigation into the Bidens. Want to bring in CNN political commentator Van Jones, host of the Van Jones Show on CNN, and CNN commentator Bakari Sellers. You gentlemen are both accomplished lawyers, so I, I am pleased to be in your company this morning. So, Bakari, when you see these text messages in black and white, what does that do to the discussion now? Well, it bolsters a great case that I believe House Democrats already had. I think one of the things the Republican Party has done, which has been very good, although it's been somewhat, uh, 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 it's destroyed the, the contours of the conversation, is state that, the, that a quid pro quo was actually necessary to convict the president or to show that there's been a high crime or misdemeanor. That's simply not the case. But in these text messages, you actually bolster the case that there was some type of quid pro quo. The, the fact of the matter is, the only thing that has to happen for someone to commit the crime, which I believe the president has done, in fact, he said it out of his own mouth, is you have to solicit or receive some type of, uh, some type of foreign assistance from a, from a foreign government. And we've seen the president not only receive that, or, or we believe he received that in the 2016 election, but we've also seen him ask for it on the, on the lawn of the White House yesterday. And so when these things are combined, these text messages just bolster the case of the House Democrats, who now have every uh, leg to stand on in this impeachment inquiry. Van, we just had former Republican Senator Judd Gregg on, who wasn't happy with me, but it was a good discussion about what should go <laughs> on in Congress now and, and how Republicans should be behaving. And he said he doesn't like any of this, mm -hmm. but he doesn't see it as impeachable. Well, I mean, a couple of things are going on here. First of all, uh, the Republicans uh, made the cases. Uh, everything was no quid pro quo. Well, now you're starting to see that evidence come in. I think Republicans are they're, they're going to have to get in a huddle and figure out what they're going to do now. Part of what you see happening here, which we haven't talked about, is that politically what this means is raw terror on the part of Donald Trump of Joe Biden. That's a part of what's going on here. You, which you, you have a, a, a White House. Everybody thinks about Donald Trump as like, you know, you know Trumposaurus Rex, you know, uh, Trumpzilla. He's this unstoppable force. Joe Biden, he's old. He's, he's a has-been. We got to find somebody else. That's apparently not how the White House sees Joe Biden. They know they can't beat Joe Biden in a fair fight, and they're trying to dirty him up. And they're willing, apparently, to abuse the, the, the power and the authority of the White House to do it. All right, friends, I want to change subjects radically now to a discussion over the last 48 hours that you've both been a part of. And we talked about here on this show yesterday, and it had to do with a trial in Texas. Amber Geiger convicted uh, of killing both of John in his apartment. He was unarmed. He was watching television. She walked in and shot him. Uh, she received 10 years, a 10-year sentence. And then there was this scene in the courtroom after the sentence with his brother, Brant John, hugging her. Let's watch this. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please. Yes. A lot of people, when they saw it, uh, this really emotional, dramatic moment of forgiveness. I think that was a first reaction among some Bakari. But when you saw it, there were more reactions than just that. Please explain. Well, I mean, I, I respect uh, both of John's brother for uh, taking what action, whatever action necessary to, to help him in the grieving process. Um, but when you take a step back, uh, the imagery that's seen, not just at that moment, but also the judge hug hugging Ms. Geiger later, um, it, it, it infuriates me. It drives me crazy because what you see is a, is a place and in, in a posture in which African-Americans, black folk, always are, are having to show forgiveness when that is not reciprocated. Um, someone once asked me about reconciliation and they said, when can we get to a place where uh, white people in this country say, I'm sorry, and black people say, we forgive you? The problem is that black folk have always said, we always get to a point of forgiveness way before we get to a point of, I'm sorry. And I just wish Amber Geiger, before she had to murder someone um, in their own home while sexting, refusing to give them CPR, decided to have some compassion um, and now we have to be in a position of forgiveness. This isn't a scene about forgiveness. This isn't a scene about grace. This is another black man dead at the hands of someone who didn't give them the benefit of their humanity. And for me, I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired, to quote Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
You know, um, I, I, I understand that, uh, that pain, and, it, and it's frustrating. I mean, whenever you do have, whenever you have uh, violence or a killing across racial lines, things are very heightened. It's not just those individuals. There's a whole history here. And African Americans have had to develop almost superhuman powers of grace and forgiveness because of our enslavement, for where we were victimized for you know, 300 years, unspeakable crimes every day, and Jim Crow terrorism. And so we have a capacity for grace in our community. The way that we uh, deal with our faith uh, gives us that, um, and it's not reciprocated. And so I think it's, I, I felt, you know, I was moved because I've been in and out of prisons. You know, I did the Redemption Project um, in and out of prisons. I've seen that forgiveness happen across racial lines in both directions, but you don't see it happen that often in public. And I think part of the problem that people have is that the sentence was so short. If she'd been given 100 years or the death penalty or something like that, I think people would have felt at least that the sentence was, was just, and then you have grace. But a challenge whenever you're dealing with redemption, whenever you're dealing with reconciliation, wherever you're dealing with restorative justice is uh, cheap grace, unearned grace. And that becomes very, very challenging. That said, when you have someone uh, like this young man who said, I know my brother, and my brother would have wanted me to do this, I think that we have to give him that credit, we have to give him that respect, and we have to give him that praise because it's very hard to do what he did. And uh, th listen, we've had two interracial hugs now. You had those toddlers who hugged each other. That got seen all around the world. Now we have this, and there's, some, there's something happening where there's- But this there, isn't about it. Yeah, well, but, 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 but Kari, I'm, I just, I'm, I'm just saying we've had these two interracial hugs. Um, there's, there's some desire or some tension or something where people are trying to figure out how do we come together? This one, however, is much more painful for black people to see because that, that, that love and that grace and, and, and forgiveness is almost never reciprocated. Bukhari, about 30 seconds. Yeah, this, this isn't about, I, I love Van with all my heart, and this shows that African Americans are not monolithic, but this isn't about an interracial hug. This is about a young man who will not be able to raise a family, will not be able to walk down the aisle, will not be able to enjoy the fruits of his labor, will not be able to live because somebody took away his life because they did not believe in his dignity. So that's what this is about. That's first and foremost. And the, the last thing about this grace is, I saw a judge, now I know people are going to say, well, she's black. Well, she's a part of an oppressive system. Come down and hug someone who is a murderer. I've been in courts over a thousand times. I've probably done nearly a thousand pleas. I've never seen a judge hug a client the, 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 or defendant the, or a murderer. The problem is that this grace is never reciprocated. Mm -hmm. And as a black man in America, the most frustrating thing is that I have to be in a perpetual state of rage. And that is a, that is a very difficult burden to bear. And I'm tired of giving grace and forgiveness that, that is apparently a one-way street. Van Bakari, I really do appreciate this discussion. Uh, I think it's important and much more complicated than I think people first realized. Appreciate you being here, guys. Thank you. All right. That was an important discussion. Thanks so much to our international viewers for watching. For you, CNN Newsroom with Christina McFarlane is next. For our U.S. viewers, text messages have come out in the Ukraine scandal. A Republican on the House Intelligence Committee up next. New Day continues right now. This is CNN Breaking News. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to your new day. It is Friday, October 4th, 8 o'clock now in the East, and we have breaking developments in the impeachment investigation. While you were sleeping, text messages have come out from Kurt Volker. He's that diplomat who quit the State Department just last week. These texts show how U.S. diplomats tried to acquiesce to Rudy Giuliani's demands for Ukraine to investigate the 2016 election and to investigate the Bidens. One text from a senior Ukrainian aide to Kurt Volker reads, once we have a date, we will call for a press briefing announcing upcoming visit and outlining vision for a reboot of the U.S.-Ukraine relationship, including, among other things, Burisma and election meddling in investigations. Burisma, you'll remember, is the Ukrainian gas company that had Hunter Biden on its board. Another text is from a senior U.S. diplomat. It references the hundreds of millions of dollars in U.S. aid that was withheld from Ukraine. Quote, are we now saying that security assistance and White House meeting are conditioned on the investigations? A source tells CNN the Ukrainian government went so far as to draft a public statement about its commitment to carry out these Giuliani uh, demands, but never released it, in part because Rudy Giuliani felt it did not go far enough. So a quid pro quo is defined as something for something or this for that. I give you X, you give me Y. And now we see this. We see this 
in these text messages. Also, we have President's words out loud that he spoke for the whole world to see, calling on China to investigate Joe Biden. And by the way, likewise, China should start an investigation into the Biden. CNN has new reporting on this, too. It turns out this is not the first time President Trump raised Biden's name with China. Sources tell CNN he also talked about Biden and Elizabeth Warren with Chinese President Xi in a June phone call. Today's a very important day as well. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo faces a, faces a deadline to turn over documents. And we just learned some details about how the White House plans to respond to a subpoena that could be coming today. OK, let's bring in now Republican Congressman Will Hurd. He's a member of the House Intelligence Committee. Congressman, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Have you had a chance to read these text messages yet? I, I haven't. The first time I've seen them or heard of them was, was you just reading them. Um, but these are the, this is part of the reason why I think we should be having uh, these hearings in the Intelligence uh, Committee. I, I believe the whistleblower, these were allegations. I think we got to be clear of that. But these were serious enough that warrants some of this, um, the hearings that we've, we've been having. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in hearing from more of the State Department officials. Um, I'm looking forward to reviewing the transcript of, of Mr. Volcker that happened yesterday. And today we have the IC, IG, uh, the, in the intelligence community inspector general um, to talk further about what he knew about the, the whistleblower and some of the investigations that he may yeah. have already conducted. And we'll get to that in a second. But first, mm -hmm. I just want to catch you up and our viewers because these happened overnight. So everyone sure. like you is just and us are just waking up to these mm -hmm. text messages and what they show over and over. There are dozens of pages of them. People can go to CNN.com to read them for themselves, is that there was an agreement that these diplomats, U.S. diplomats, were trying to arrange between the U.S., between President Trump and President Zelensky. And what the agreement was for was if Ukraine would agree to investigate Burisma and Joe Biden and Hunter Biden, and if Ukraine would agree to say that they were somehow connected to 2016 election interference, then they would get the military aid that Congress had approved, the hundreds of millions of dollars of military aid. I'll, read you, I'll give you a couple of examples. Here's one. This is the U.S. ambassador to the European Union. He says, do we still want Zelensky to give us an unequivocal draft of that statement with 2016 and Burisma? Then Kurt Volker says, that's the clear message so far. That was August 17th. Here's one from uh, September 1st. This is the senior U.S. diplomat in Ukraine, Bill Taylor. Are we now saying that security assistance, meaning those millions of dollars, and White House meeting are conditioned on these investigations? To which Gordon Sundland says, call me. And then uh, on September 8th, Bill Taylor says, the nightmare is that the Ukrainians give this interview, meaning the statement, and don't get the security assistance, meaning the millions of dollars. The Russians would love that, he suggests, and he would quit he suggests. Are you comfortable with seeing that kind of agreement? Uh, of course not. I'm not comfortable. And, and I think some of these things are, are indeed uh, damning. However, I want to make sure we get through uh, this entire investigation uh, before coming to some kind of conclusions. I think this is serious stuff. And these are serious matters. This has long-term implications on our foreign policy. Uh, I want to hear from Rudy Giuliani. Um, I want to hear from, from the additional folks within the State Department to put all of this stuff in, in context. And I think, uh, again, let's get to, let's have all the information available before we make a decision. But the things that you have read um, are indeed concerning. And I think it's a, it's, it's a, a confirmation of some of the veracity of the, the whistleblower's uh, report. And so this is our job on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence um, to review this type of information and try to get to the facts. Um, I know some of my colleagues want to uh, look at stuff as if this is going to support impeachment. Some are looking at it that support exoneration. I'm looking at it to find the truth. And um, this is why I'm back in D.C. today, um, to have these conversations with the ICIG. Mm -hmm. And then these, these hearings will continue yeah. next week. I, I'm interested to see how the, the White House is going to respond to the, the request for subpoenas, because there's a lot of people that should be coming in, in front of our committee. And uh, what so if they hear. stonewall? What if they don't respond to the subpoenas? 
Uh, well, I think the next step is what, what, what tools does the legislative branch have to force compliance, right? I, I think that whether that's a, a lawsuit um, that has happened in the past, uh, but this is, we are a co-equal branch of government, and this is something that you can't always claim um, executive privilege to prevent giving information to Congress. I know that you say that you're waiting for the facts to come out, but some things are happening in broad daylight, such mm -hmm. as yesterday, when on the White House lawn, the president called upon China to investigate a, his political rival, Joe Biden. So let me just play this moment for everyone. China should start an investigation into the Bidens, because what happened in China is just about as bad as what happened with, uh, with Ukraine. What do you think about that request? Uh, I, I think it's terrible. It's something that I wouldn't have done. Um, and I can go two days, I think two days before that, um, wishing China uh, uh, congratulations on 70 years of communism um, via a tweet is not something I would do, I would do either. Uh, China is, is an adversary. Uh, China right now has a million ethnic minorities, the Uyghurs, and, you know, in, in basically in prison camps. Um, also, we're in a, a, a tight and complex trade negotiation with China now, and so you're potentially giving them something to hold over your head. And, and I would expect that prior to our upcoming elections, to see the Chinese do something to manipulate their currency or impact global markets in order to have an impact on the U.S. economy going into an election. So I think that is something that, that a, a president of the United States uh, shouldn't be doing. What are you going to ask the inspector general to the Intelligence Committee when he comes before your, your committee today? Uh, I want to know who knew what when, right, when this information was given. I want to know what did the ICIG um, do in order to confirm uh, some of the veracity to make the decision that it was urgent or not. I also want to get to the bottom of, I believe that under all circumstances, whistleblower information should be transmitted uh, to Congress. And so we know uh, that the DNI missed that seven-day deadline. Uh, what was the ambiguity in the law? Because I want to fix that. Because even if the ICIG makes a determination that the information is not urgent, or even if it's not credible, I still think that information should be transmitted to, to the, the oversight committees. Um, and I'm looking forward to how do we tighten that up. So these are, these are some of the areas and some of the questions um, that we'll get. And if they have, if, he, if the ICIG um, has further information about details uh, within the report, and obviously follow up. Congressman Will Hurd, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on New Day. Thanks so much. Always a pleasure. John. All right, we do have some breaking news for you. Details as to who is now leading the White House response to impeachment and how the West Wing plans to respond to the subpoena threat today.